there are applications where 5G is enabled by AI, and then there are applications where AI is enabled by 5G. From EE Tech Media and All About Circuits, this is Moore's Lobby. I'm your host, Daniel Bogdanoff. We're on the brink of some pretty big changes. Now, that's maybe kind of always the case, but it's especially true right now in the world of wireless communications. For me, I've been on a journey of relearning what wireless systems like 5G mean for the world and for the advancement of tech. I've had to drop some of my misconceptions and educate myself so that I can fully understand what's coming and what it might mean. This conversation with today's guest, Adil Kidwai, really gave me some fresh perspective. He's the VP and head of product management at EdgeQ, where they've built a base station on a chip that combines 5G and AI capabilities into the same chip. So hang on to your seats. Today, we're going to dive deep into the world of 5G. Adil, thanks for joining me today in the lobby. Hey, thank you for having me, Daniel. Good to be here. I'm curious, how did you first get into tech and what got you excited about engineering? Ah, you are taking me back into the memory lane <laughs> 25 years ago, <laughs> even longer than that. So what got me into engineering was my love and inclination towards mathematics. I, I grew up in India. I'm from India. Very early on, I, I got really interested in mathematics. And I could go out on a limb to say I was very good at it. So from there onwards, after I finished my, my high school, I decided, you know, back in those days, growing up in India, there were not too many options for like a proper formal career, right? You could become an engineer or you could become a doctor or you could take a government job. Because of my love towards mathematics and fields associated with that, I decided to write some of the engineering examinations and I was fortunate enough to get into one of the good schools in India. So that's how it started. That's how it started. And did you then go into engineering and get a get a job right out of school? Yeah. So I graduated in 2001 from one of the IITs in India, and I got a job right after the school. I worked for Motorola for a couple of years. Uh, back in those days, Motorola was kind of, you know, numero uno in wireless communication. So that was fun for two years. But then I realized that I needed to, you know, sharpen my pencil a little bit more. So I quit my job and decided to go for uh, graduate studies. So what made you think it was time to get a more advanced degree? Was there any technology or, or skill set you felt like you wanted to, to attain? Yeah. So working for a couple of years at Marola, I got to learn a little bit more about wireless communication. And that really fascinated me. You know, the fact that two people can talk to each other wirelessly while being you know, hundreds of kilometers or miles away was really something truly amazing, right? And I started getting deeper into how the technology works. And as I got deeper and deeper into it, I realized that, you know, I, I, I needed to go back to school and learn some more uh, about wireless technology. I chose to go to uh, UCLA, which is one of the pioneers in this field. Uh, I did my graduate studies at UCLA. And the main purpose was to learn and know more about wireless technology. And that realization came after I bumped into some smart people at Marola, talked to them about, you know, what was their career progression? How did they learn the magic that was there? So that was that was it. I find RF training almost exclusively happens on the job or in grad school these days. And I, everything I've learned has been through through working with other people who know RF. Were you doing research at UCLA? What were you working on there? Yeah, so UCLA has a branch uh, inside of electrical engineering. They have a, a kind of a subsection called circuits and systems. And they have, like, I would say pretty high bar to graduate in that department. You have to tape out a chip. Wow. Yeah, you have to tape out a chip. The chip has to work. You have to publish some papers or journals, articles based upon the results of your chip. So I did research at UCLA in the field of pre-distortion, power amplifiers pre-distortion. I spent Around two and a half to three years there, uh, I did tape out a chip. It came back. It worked. I did all the check, 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 <laughs> whatever was supposed <laughs> to be done there to graduate. But it was fun. It was fun. Uh, I was fortunate to be advised by some industry and academic luminaries. Uh, my my advisor was Professor Bairam Jalali, and my co-advisor was Professor Asad Abidi. 
uh, both of them uh, you know are, are stalwarts in the field of wireless design so learned a lot from them and my colleagues and my fellow students so it was fun so I have a couple questions. First off, can you talk me through just very briefly RF amplifiers and why pre-distortion matters? Yeah, RF amplifiers. Yeah, that's a, that's topic very close to my heart. So when you have a wireless device, you know, a phone or any wireless device, you have to transmit a signal such that it reaches what we call base station or some other device. The signal has to reach somewhere. Like for example, you are speaking to somebody. You want your voice to reach to that person, right? Otherwise, how would that person know what, what you're saying? Similarly, in wireless communication, the signal has to reach a certain distance. And uh, you want it to reach very, very long distance because the person having cell phone may be in a remote village or a, or a remote highway. To be able to do that, you have to make the signal stronger. How do you make the signal stronger? You have to amplify the signal. What the, and that's why the word amplifier, right? Uh, a, a one milliwatt power signal has to be amplified to 10 watts or 50 watts, right? Once you amplify the signal, the circuit that does this amplification is called power amplifier. Power amplifier because it amplifies the power. There are a lot of imperfections built into power amplifiers which become very obvious once the amplification factor becomes very, very high. So for example, you know, if you are amplifying a one milliwatt signal to 10 watt signal, it's like what? 10,000 times amplification, right? So the imperfections of the amplifier itself come become very, very dominant. And the amplifier starts creating signals which you don't even want to be created. In that scenario, you want to linearize that amplifier such that it behaves the way it's supposed to behave. That is kind of the easiest way I could describe linearization of power amplifiers. Okay. So basically at that level of amplification, the output doesn't necessarily look like the input. So you can change the input to make the output look like you want it to look. Yeah. So it's the technique is called pre-distortion. So what you do is you pre-distort the signal knowing the nonlinearity of the amplifier such that the output and input are similar signals. Of course, amplified, but similar signals. The nonlinearities are canceled, so to say, right? Right. Uh, so that is kind of the the, the theory behind pre-distortion. There are a couple of ways to pre-distort. There are analog pre-distortion and there are digital pre-distortion. Both have you know pros and cons. Back in the days, in this was 2002, 2003 when I was doing this, analog pre-distortion was very predominant. Uh, and I have to say, since then, digital pre-distortion has taken over. And 2005, 6, 10 onwards, it's all digital pre-distortion now. Right. But nevertheless, the signal has to be pre-distorted for it to be useful in such level of amplification. So to tape out a chip and get published for grad school sounds more like a PhD work than master's work from what I've seen. <laughs> yeah. Did you consider just going all the way through for a PhD or was a master's, you felt like you, you got what you needed out of it? Yeah, I, I did not consider PhD at that point. Actually, I, I, I could do one, but I because I was coming from the industry, Right, I I'd worked before coming to graduate school. I had a very focused view of what I wanted to get out of graduate school. I felt that in two and a half years, I did get what I wanted to to get out of that. Well, and what an exciting time to be an RF specialist! So after after grad school, you had a, a brief stint at Nvidia, but then did some really exciting things at Intel. Can you tell me some of those career highlights for you? Yeah, so I uh, after graduate school, I I had a few offers from the industry. I joined NVIDIA. NVIDIA at that point had some ambitions to do wireless communication, development some, of some wireless chips. However, they changed their mind after I joined. Uh, I was so much into wireless. I was so fascinated with that field that I decided that I'm I'm gonna pursue my 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 you know uh, uh, dream of working as a wireless engineer. So then I left NVIDIA and join Intel Corporation. Uh, Intel at that time was developing Wi-Fi and or starting to develop Wi-Fi for their own CPUs. So I started working in that department and made some cool products there for, for several years. What was the state of Wi-Fi at that point in time? <laughs> and what sort of advances were you able to make? Yeah, a uh, few tens of megabits per second. Yeah. Okay. MIMO was just coming, coming up, right? Uh, the world was learning about MIMO. Can you briefly share what MIMO is? 
Yeah, MIMO stands for multi input, multi output, where um, there you could transmit multiple streams and thereby gain in terms of uh, you know signal to noise ratio, signal quality, because uh, diversity and stuff like that. These are very heavy wireless terms, but I hope the audience will be able to connect to those, some, at least some of those. But yeah, at that time, Wi Fi was, you know, tens of megabit per second, one stream up, two stream down, something like that. And since then, of course, it's all history. Wi-Fi is now you know, multi-gigabit per second protocol, processing you know, hundreds of megahertz of signal. So Wi-Fi has come a long way, and you know, so has the entire wireless industry as well. Yeah, can you, can you tell me a little bit about why Max? Yeah, yeah. So when I started my career at Intel, the industry was kind of wanted an alternative cellular protocol. There was one way to do things, which was like LTE way of things. And the industry wanted another cellular protocol. And uh, Intel became a champion of that. Uh, Intel started by Max. Uh, the whole, uh, there was a whole division working on by Max. Intel did a lot of partnership. One famous partnership was, if my memory serves me right, was with Sprint. Intel started its own journey into wireless because at that time it was very clear to every compute company that uh, you have to have connectivity as well. And indoor Wi-Fi kind of connectivity was not was not, not sufficient. It was it was necessary but not sufficient. So Intel started that WiMAX effort. Uh, however, after I think three four years of effort, I worked on that program as well. Uh, did some testing for, for WiMAX chips. I still remember having gotten a USB stick which has a WiMAX transceiver, and I plugged in that stick in my in my laptop and with one of my friends. Uh, I used to live in Portland at that time. I worked at Intel Portland. With one of my friends, he drove his car, and we kind of just just went around Hillsboro area in Portland, near Portland, and we are sick, checking the signal quality. You know how many, <laughs> how does the signal quality, how many dBMs I'm seeing, and stuff like that. It was fun activity. However, I believe there were business reasons because of which Bimax did not took off, and you know LTE took off, and you know, the rest is history. And the the frequencies that WiMAX was using are are things we're talking about like for 5G now and using for 5G now. What was it like working at uh, I, I see like ten you know tens of gigahertz frequency ra- ranges? To answer your first question, like 5G actually has two different sets of frequency range called FR1 and FR2, right? Uh, FR1 is popularly known as sub six gigahertz uh, frequencies. And FR2 is millimeter wave, right? Right. So um, YMAX was in that FR1 zone, right? Okay. Uh, uh, at that time, millimeter wave was not very common. Although 60 giga- gigahertz in Wi-Fi was taking shape. Hmm. Um, it was just very early days of 60 gigahertz of Wi-Fi back in those days. But YMAX was not into millimeter wave zone. It was in, in the sub-6, 3 three gigahertz cellular frequencies, typical cellular frequency at that time, were actually 900 megahertz to you know, 2.6 gigahertz, if my memory serves me right. Okay. No, no like exotic materials. It was exotic. It was exotic because, you know, we were going for uh, outdoor cellular long distance communication, right? Okay. Yeah. Several miles of coverage uh, with a tower with some data as well. So it, it was exotic. Okay. <laughs> for that time it was. I was not around in the tech scene at that point. So it's interesting to hear how some of that played out. And when I think of Intel during that period, I think like processing and compute. What was the culture and perception like for the wireless teams in Intel? So it was very clear uh, to Intel and, as I said, every other compute company in the world that you have to have connectivity along with compute, right? It was clear to them back then. And Intel tried a few times to do wireless. Internally, eventually the well Wi-Fi we are doing internally anyways. We had a very very successful Wi-Fi program on which uh, I was working and for several years, and the program what I hear is continues to be very very successful even today. For cellular, Intel decided in 2010, if I remember correctly, to go uh, inorganic for cellular. So they acquired a company called Infineon Wireless, a part of Infineon Wireless, uh, which was based out of Germany. And that was kind of their solid step into cellular, I would say, right? They acquired the talent, they acquired the, the roadmap and the IPs. So yeah, it was very clear that 
along with compute, you need connectivity. And inside connectivity, it cannot only be indoor Wi-Fi connect connect connectivity. It has to be outdoor connectivity because you know the laptops, tablets, phones eventually have to you know go out of the office as well. So you were a part of that Infineon wireless acquisition and that that move. You, you kind of laid out the the reasoning for it. Can you tell me what that was like and what you were doing as a part of that that acquisition? Yeah. So so uh, I was based out of Portland, as I mentioned, Portland, Oregon and uh, working on Wi-Fi and Bluetooth indoor connectivity kind of products. And then Intel made this decision to acquire Infineon Wireless Business. I got the opportunity to go to and work in Munich with the team there, with the Infineon Wireless team, and kind of help the two teams integrate with each other, right? The Intel and the Infineon Wireless. So I, I moved to Munich along with my family. I lived there for three years. And it was one of the you know best experiences of my life. I learned a different culture, a different way of thinking, a different way of working, uh, made a lot of friends. They still continue, continue to be my, my good friends in Munich uh, and in the areas around it. That was the first time that Intel was exposed to doing cellular wireless, and there is there is different way to think about cellular wireless. Intel being a very, very hardcore compute company, as you can imagine, and it continues to be to be so. It's very, very successful at that. But wireless was kind of a different beast. And we were super successful with that acquisition as well, right? So the acquisition, Intel famously grabbed Apple's account, shipped yeah. several generations of modems. So uh, it was a lot of learning for all of us, including Intel as a company. What, what about cellular networks was different and surprising, coming at it from a Wi-Fi background? So the first difference is that the in cellular world, outside world, the signal quality tends to be very, very poor because you might be in a very, very remote village where and the cell phone tower may be miles away from you. So you have to resolve that signal. In the language of wireless communication, you have to be able to work with super, super low SNR. Sometimes the signal is actually buried inside the noise and you have to find that out, right? So you, your, your, your modem has to process much, much dirtier signals, so to say. Uh, and that puts restriction into, you know, what kind of channel estimation algorithm you are using, what kind of equalization you are using, uh, what kind of encoding you are using, stuff like that, right? That is one part of it. Second part of it is in cellular communication, the 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 device moves, right? Yeah. Uh, if you're on a freeway, you are running at you know 80 miles per hour, 60 miles per hour, and you are on a call. You don't want that call to 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 be cut, right? And you you want to be continue to keep talking, even when you are traveling, you know, tens or hundreds of miles, right? You don't want your call to be cut, and it does not cut. So that's kind of the magic which is called handover in cellular network which is not required for wi-fi sure because in wi-fi you could just pause the data for a quick second and switch over but you pause the data and you wouldn't even notice that the data was paused right right uh, because it's all buffered and stuff like that and the third thing is that cellular connections have to be very very predictable which means that if you want access to the channel if you are calling somebody you want the call to go through if you're downloading some data you want the data to to be downloaded right which means that there is a scheduling aspect in cellular, which means all the devices connecting to a base station have to be scheduled, scheduled properly to the slot boundary, as, as they call it. Uh, Wi-Fi does not have this restriction. Wi-Fi is primarily a data kind of centric protocol, and the scheduling algorithms in Wi-Fi are much, much lighter, much, much, much lighter as compared to cellular. So these are some of the key differences. I mean, there are like tens of more differences, but these, I, I would think these, these come at the top. And it does seem like cellular is such a different animal. Like the the problem statement is so dramatically different. Yeah, exactly. And 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 one thing which I did not notice is you know you you buy a cell phone in the U.S. and then you travel to uh, Japan. Yeah. And this has to work. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The cellular frequencies are different. There's a different operator. It it just has to work. And you know you want to make that phone call right after after the plane lands, right? <laughs> because. <laughs> right. And, and, and if the phone call doesn't go through, you are not happy, right? Yeah. So the the, the quality uh, uh, standards in the cellular protocol are much, much tighter. So how is that adjustment period for you and the teams? I mean, that's uh, clearly why you acquire a, a business like that is to to get some of that baked in knowledge that, that people understand this. But yeah. what what was that like for you coming into a new technology? At some point when you've been working on Wi-Fi that's in hundreds of millions of devices, you have to feel like you kind of know what's going on on some level. Yeah, I mean, look, 
the fundamentals of wireless are same or similar right between all these process all these technologies uh, information theory was you know discovered invented whatever you want to call it 50 years ago and the fundamentals remain same mathematics behind it remains same so it was different from one perspective that uh, you know these are the i i i counted few of the key different differences however the fundamental of technology remains same in a sense that a dirty signal had to be received had to be amplified it had to be processed in the baseband the channel has to be equalized and stuff like that so there were a lot of similarities as well as differences for a person like me who kind of had had worked in wireless had the fundamentals of wireless it was not that steep of a transition i would say however it was it definitely opened the door for a lot of new things which i was not exposed to uh, working on indoor uh, wireless standards like wifi and bluetooth So I'm looking at the state of where cellular networks and research is now. What do you think would be most surprising to you back when you were working on 3G, 4G when you're looking now at, you know, LTE, 5G and maybe 6G? What what about the new stuff would have surprised you back then? I think if someone would have told me 10 years ago that cellular network will become more about things and devices than people, mm. I would probably had, you know, question that uh because you know wifi 2g 3g 4g everything was about people right you have to send text a person has to send text a person has to watch videos a person has to download you know go to a website and go to you know download a youtube video uh, this was all going on from you know wifi bluetooth it was all person to person communication or something has to do with humans mm. 5g changed it in a big time 5g is more about things small small devices than it is about you and me talking right uh, that is a very very drastic change that 5g brought in uh, and that is something that when 5g standards was standard was being written that is something that had surprised many of us a, a cat m lt cat m was there you know from the lt days there you could think that the number of devices that are connected to cellular network is going to be much much more than the number of humans which are connected on the phone so to say right It's interesting to think going from human processing speeds like how fast can our brain process things and how much information can we intake versus how much yeah. a electronic device can intake and how much how fast they can process that puts a whole another burden of of requirements on on a new wireless network. Oh, absolutely. What one of the topics that seems forefront for me today and with that in mind would be ai how did you go from working on cellular human based communication processes into ai which is, to me feels like a total left turn yeah yeah so i made this transition while i was at intel actually okay so while i was at intel in 2018 around that time frame i i i said to myself that you know i spent a lot of time in wireless you know worked on many generations of wireless many types of wireless let's try something different Intel had acquired a company called Nirvana Systems and I got an opportunity to work in with that team. When I moved that trans made that transition from 5G or cellular wireless to AI, uh, I also thought that it would be an orthogonal field. AI was kind of a shiny object for everybody, right? Sure. You know, <laughs> yeah, a new thing to learn. So I I I kind of got interested into that. I did some projects on my own and got really really excited about AI, so I made the switch, professional career switch and to my surprise ai was not that different i realized that ai borrowed a lot of concepts from information theory which were developed like 50 years ago mm. um, you know a, a lot of mathematics between ai and 5g and 4g is actually same i have actually a, a video on my on hq website where i talk about commonalities between 5g and ai mathematics the convolution the matrix multiplication uh, nonlinear operations pooling average max stuff like that These concepts were developed in the field of information theory like in 1970s. Mm. AI took those concepts and made them even more powerful in their applications in the field of AI. So when I started going deep into the mathematics of AI, I was pleasantly surprised that hey, I, a lot of things here make sense to me because I knew <laughs> I knew that coming into this. That was my transition to AI and it was fun because as I mentioned it was not something completely new. If you go to a new place or new field uh, if you find a lot of commonalities 
it's always a good thing. Interesting to hear that there are similarities. It does make sense. There's a lot of matrix math there. So you start doing AI and you're at Intel for 10 years. What makes you decide that it's time for a change, time to mix it up? So I was doing good at Intel, reasonably well. I, AI was also, you know, I rammed up fast because of the commonalities I brought with me. And at that time, I started thinking about, okay, so connectivity and compute, 5G and AI are not too different. Then, right? In the same 2019 time frame, I was introduced to a gentleman named Vinay Ravori. And we met at a, you know, for a lunch and we just clicked because he also was thinking exactly the same direction that AI and 5G are not too different. He came from Qualcomm and a pretty strong background also in wireless and AI. And we just clicked. We both were thinking about the same similar things. We thought about, you know, the same five year, 10 year where the technology will be. So, so it was a good good discussion with him and i learned that he was starting this this new company and i said to myself you know it's time to time to explore new things what was it like going from intel which is decidedly enterprise scale into a startup world and was there anything that was especially freeing or especially challenging for you yeah startups startups are anyway you know you can imagine very, very different from a, a big company or any big company. Intel is not just one of them. However, what made it more challenging when I joined this uh, uh, HQ was that, you know, the the whole world changed after that. I joined HQ in January of 2020 and after within three months, COVID happened. <laughs> yeah, what a time, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we moved to a completely online working mode and that kind of added a bunch of more complexities. You know, we had to raise money. We had to raise our Series A. We had to hire people. Uh, we had to ramp up. When I when I joined HQ, there were only tens of people. Now we are hundreds of us. Uh, so we had to quickly ramp the team. COVID what was at its peak. You could not travel. At the same time, we knew that being a startup, we have limited runway, so which means that we had to run fast. How do you run fast when you cannot travel or when you cannot meet anybody in person? So a lot of challenges were added. To answer a specific question about what is the difference between working at a, at a startup versus working at a big company like Intel, decision making tends to be very, very fast at startups because uh, you, know, you have a particular view of the world and you are the one who is making the decision. You don't have to kind of go to 10 people and ask for their blessings. That's how startups operate. That's why they are very fast. So that is something that you know, had to change within me and I, I and i did that change pretty fast and I'm, I'm good at changes seems like it you know, because it's a question of existence all of a sudden right um, <laughs> and, and that completely changes your thought process trust me it completely changes your thought process so getting into the technology a little more as you look at 5g and some of the early releases and even now you know release 16 17 that we're through in right now mm -hmm. what about the 5g standard and the the technology behind 5G is is good for AI and how does how does that merge together into what EdgeQ is doing so that's a great question so AI and 5G fundamentally from the mathematics perspective very very deep mathematics are very similar from the application perspective they are completely different right one is wireless other is right compute however these two technologies support each other in the world that we are living in, in the world that we are going to live in. So 5G and AI are actually complementary to each other. And that's where SQ is creating a lot of value in. The way we define this is there are applications where 5G is enabled by AI, and then there are applications where AI is enabled by 5G. Hmm. Uh, allow me to give you a few examples of each, right? Uh, it will be clear. Please. I'm trying to wrap my head around it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it, it can, be, can be confusing, but it will be clear in the next few minutes. So 5G enabled by AI, how AI can make 5G better. So 5G has a lot of algorithms running to make it 5G or any, any you know, 4G or 3G. You know, channel estimation, equalization, you know, symbol processing, uh, scheduling. Can these algorithms be helped by AI? Can there be a model which can be created where these algorithms can predict how the environment around a cell phone is behaving. Mm. Uh, 
for example, in a factory setting, for example, if you have a 5G box, then a model can be created of, for example, how is the interference around that box during the day? Because the interference probably will not change or AI can model all that. Can this model be used to use a better channel estimation algorithm during certain point of the day? In, in short, using AI to make 5G better. When you are scheduling a user during the day in a factory, let's say that particular machine is on from 4 to 6 in the evening or the other machine is on from 1 to 2 in the evening. Can a AI model be created where the machine which is on at a particular time be given more importance by 5G? Mm. So in that scenario, 5G is assisted by AI. And there's a few videos on our website. I encourage you and your audience to please go there and take a look. Now let's come to AI enabled by 5G, particularly edge AI, where think about a camera on a, on a, on a bridge. We is counting cars passing by, car passing by, uh, by the bridge. And let's say it's counting how many red cars pass by, how many blue cars pass by. As simple as that, right? And let's say it has to give this information to a central command center in a very time, time critical fashion. In that case, 5G, the ultra low latency feature that 5G provides can help AI. AI is the main application helped by 5G. Think about an airport where there's a camera looking at all the people who are coming inside an airport and trying to detect a gun, for example, if somebody is carrying a gun with them. As soon as the camera detects a gun, the information has to be given to the central command center within like milliseconds so that corrective action can be taken. 5G comes to the rescue uh, because it's very, very low latency. So in, that, in such cases, AI is the main application and 5G helps AI to make AI better. So that's what I meant, 5G, enabled and assisted by AI, and AI enabled and assisted by 5G. So these are two complementary technologies. The way HQ has implemented them into our silicon is by exploiting the common mathematics behind these two technologies. We don't have a 5G like engine, so to say, in the chip and an AI engine in the chip. Interesting. We have one on the same, okay? Hmm. And by software programming, you can use the silicon as an entirely as an AI chip or as entirely as a 5G chip oh. uh, or half AI and half 5G. So that's kind of the, the big discovery uh, uh, at HQ. That's fascinating because normally a, a, a chip is specific to one task, but for, to have it be able mm -hmm. to do AI or 5G or both and not have them just be you know, discrete logic blocks on the, on the chip is really interesting. Correct, correct. Yeah, and that brings a lot of cost saving because you don't have two separate chips doing separate things. A lot of power saving, particularly in the application where 5G is helping AI or AI is helping 5G, the, the common mathematics makes them you know, intermingle with each other, right? They, they are not two different process, processors. Yeah. So a lot of power saving can be done, which is very, very critical for edge applications. So what are some interesting applications that you see for a chip that has this combined capability? Where, where would it deploy and what would it do? The opportunities when you combine 5G and AI are actually unlimited because there's a huge, huge market for 5G and coming uh, 6G in, in the future, right? Where you can use AI to make these technologies better. Sometimes you get better spectrum efficiency. Sometimes you get better range. Sometimes you get better scheduling, better services to your users. So in that case, you do need AI and you do, not, you do not want to spend extra money to get that AI, right? Or extra power to get that AI. So literally entire application space of 5G can benefit from AI and SQ fits nicely in that application space because we have merged these two things together. You mentioned base station on a chip. What we have also done in at SQ is we have merged some other functions of base station like networking functions, so to say, in addition to modern functions into the silicon. And that's why we call base station on a chip. We can process the entire base station functionality into the single chip. You don't need two or three chips as compared to our competitors and what is right now there in the market or what used to be in the market a year ago. Interesting. So like a, a, a traditional base station would have a radio side of things, which is communicating to the, the user equipment or the UEs, like, you know, cell phones, whatever. Yeah. And then it has a networking side, which connects back into the, you know, the core network and, and a base station would have to 
to marry those two together and go from user equipment into okay. core network. Okay. So this chip has the networking stuff and it can also manage, you know, AI radio management channel decisions, that sort of thing. Absolutely. So so it's called RAN, radio access network. So in a RAN, the typical components, right? You have five processing, which is kind of the brain behind the 5G, where you have a lot of heavy lifting of Fourier transforms and sample processing and encoding and decoding and channel estimation and stuff like that happens, right? It is kind of the brain of a 5G model. Then you have what is known as networking subsystem, where you are processing packets. You are inserting security protocols. You are decoding security protocols, IP security and stuff like that. You are you are doing crypto and stuff like that. So that is the other thing. The third part of the net, uh, RAN, the base station, so to say, is timing. Uh, these base stations have to be time synchronized to a master clock, mm. to a grandmaster, what we call it. So all these functions, and including sample processing, including and and previous technologies like 4G and 5G, all these functions are needed to implement the RAN. The silicon that SQ has built, we have merged all these functions into a single chip, into a very tiny chip, it's VA big, and these are all base station functions that uh, can be done into the single chip. There's no requirement to talk about, to talk between multiple chips. You know, one of the our customer told us that the functionality that you guys are implementing in this chip, to do similar functionality, I need to have six chips. Six. Can you believe that? Six. Uh, open a PCB and you see six chips. They have to talk to each other. They have to synchronize to each other and stuff like that, right? All that stuff goes away. You just need one silicon from HQ and that does everything that you need to do. Yeah, just the engineering challenge of integrating that many you know, high-end specialty chips into one system would be difficult. I've noticed that you know, EdgeQ describes this product sometimes as a software-defined radio, yeah. but I, I understand you're hoping to flip that phrase on its head a little bit. Can you tell me traditionally what SDR would mean and then kind of what, what EdgeQ envisions SDR could be and is? Yeah, yeah, good question. So... Software defined radios are not is not new concept by the way. No. When I was in grad school, there were still software defined radios. You know, radio which could be programmed. However, there was one problem that the industry could never solve. Every time you come to you talk, you tell somebody that okay, I have a software defined radio, tribal knowledge tells you that that means you must be consuming a lot of power. Because softwareization typically meant that you are running on some general purpose processors and which means there are a lot of power is burned, right? Software defined radios, SDRs, never kind of took off in a big way because of this, this handicap. Flexibility versus power consumption were always two different things. You could get one or the other. Sure. We cracked that nut at HQ. Mm. You must have seen on our website that we, we use a processor called RISC-5. Yep. So we use we are a RISC five processor company and we use RISC five to implement the entire four G and five G and AI engine. And RISC five gives you a very special ability. It gives you ability to extend the ISA. You can write your own custom instructions oh. when you are using RISC five. And once you do that, you know what special functions you want to do in five G and AI. So you write specific instructions to do those functions. And as a result of that you control the timing of those functions at a very simple, at, you know, microsecond level granularity. Once you do that, no power is wasted because as soon as you are finished doing that work, you shut it off. Then you go to the next function. You finish doing that work, you shut that one off. Mm. So these custom instructions are C intrinsic, could be called by, called as a function and you could implement 5G or 4G or AI functionality, which we have done. Uh, HQ offers you a, a field uh, deployable physical layer. So we have done all that hard work. But as a result of that, we could program the silicon, but still not consume a lot of power. So our power profile is the best in the industry. To the nearest competition, we are one third of the power consumption. Wow. And yet fully software programmable. So that is kind of, you know, the, a little bit history on SDR and how we redefine SDR because we don't have any so to say, bad things associated with SDR, but still we are fully programmable. It's interesting to be able to define your own instructions, especially, you know, like risk is reduced instruction set, uh, computer, computer. It's funny to be able to add your own instructions back into it. But 
for a specialty chip like this, it seems like there's huge advantages. Absolutely. Absolutely. So 5G is kind of here, but it's also still growing a lot. And there's talk of 6G on the horizon. Where is all of this going from your perspective? And how do you scale with with, with the technology that's moving so fast? Yeah. So when we started this, started this company five years ago, we realized, realized a few things. First of all, as I mentioned before, 5G is more about things than it is about just the phone, right? Uh, it's about machine to machine communication. It's about enterprise deployment and stuff like that, right? So one thing that we realized and our thought process was kind of shaped by that is that not everyone in the world will use every available feature on 5G. Sure. 5G comes with a lot of different features like low latency, high security, high bandwidth, you know, gazillion other features. When we talked to the operators and the customers, potential customers, when we were starting this company, they said, you know what, 5G is interesting, but I don't want all the big enchilada of, you know, features of 5G. I just want this one. I want sure. somebody said I just want low latency. Somebody said I want just want high throughput. The other thing that we were given feedback on, and that was very solid feedback uh, actually, and that also shaped HQ. And that was, you know, 5G is good. It gives me a lot of flexibility, features, low latency, security, blah blah. But I don't want to spend 5x into 5G as compared to what I'm doing right now. I'm good with whatever I have, you know, LTE or Wi-Fi, whatever I have. These two feedbacks shaped our architecture. We define our architecture software defined, which means we have a very innovative business model, actually. We sell our chip and enable the features only the ones which the customers want. Mm. So if a customer comes and says, I just want URLLC, ultra-reliable, low-latency communication, I just give him that feature and the pricing is different. If a customer says, I want the entire entry of 5G, release 15, 16, and coming 17, then I give them the, all the features and the pricing is different, right? So we gave the customers the flexibility of choosing the features from a large menu of 5G features. Where we see the market going in future as, you know, as 6G is also coming forward is programmability, low power, and the choice to the customers to pick the features which they want mm. is going to be super, super critical. Because of the choice the customers have to pick the features, they can actually manage their costs. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, you give them all the features of 5G and ask them to pay 5x of the price. They'll say, you know what? I'm good with where I am right now. It's like it's like supercomputers exist, but they're way too expensive for what I need. But I do like having, you know, being able to edit this podcast, for example, without much latency or slow rendering time. You got it. You got it. This, yeah, this is a great example, Daniel. Interesting. So, yeah. So going forward in 6G, we believe programmability is going to play a large role. We believe that scalability is also going to play a large role, meaning you should be able to scale from, let's say, gigabit per second modem to 10 gigabit per second modem to 20 gigabit per second modem. AI is going to play a bigger role than it is playing today. You know, we thought about it very early in the game. A lot of our, our competitors are going in the same direction, realizing it now. So these are a few of the from 20,000 feet, I can think about how the market will move in the next you know, five years. Yeah. Well, and having a five-year head start is a huge advantage in a space like this. <laughs> like five years ago, <laughs> the world of wireless was very different. Okay. One of the other things I see looking in the future, and I, I know Edge Q is exploring this as well, is non-terrestrial networks. And mm -hmm. I understand with the right like satellite constellations, some communication from a stock, you know, 5G release 17 handset could communicate to, to satellites. Yeah. Can you talk about where you see NTNs going and what might surprise people about, about that world? Yeah, so actually, these kind of networks are already there. Uh, there are companies which are providing internet via satellites right now, it's up today. And eventually, it's kind of an extreme form of wireless. Yeah. Because... You know, when you think about your home, for example, you know, majority of people's home, you, somebody has to dig a hole on the road and get a wire to your house and then you create a Wi-Fi out of it, right? So it's kind of our quest to make the world wireless. Uh, nobody like, like wires. And NTN, non-terrestrial networks, uh, is another step in that direction. 
that what if the internet can be provided just by satellites which which are up there in the sky and you know you don't see it you don't see them it is coming as a release 17 feature and sq fully supports that and one of the key reasons why we support features as new as ntn so early is because we are fully software defined mm. all the ntn features can be written into a c code and run on the silicon at a very low power so that is a, that is a very solid adjacency that we are catering right now the ntn networks and it is it is fascinating right because think about your just a small antenna at your rooftop and it's just getting internet gigabit per second internet i think the speeds right now are not that high but you know it's a, it's an evolution it's i think in next 3 4 years this will this will grow very fast yeah the coverage the coverage change especially for 6g i know that's a big thing that people are looking at is how do we you know like on my phone with 5g i can stream a 4k video with audio without buffering right like so Correct. from a user perspective as a human there's not a huge need for an increase in speed yeah. so exploring coverage and what that means for you know smart factories and that sort of thing becomes a much bigger consideration yeah coverage coverage and and reliability latency security right yeah speed is just one part of it right coverage reliability latency security and speed so this is kind of five elements of the protocols that are here right now like 5g and which are coming in future right yeah so that's why i said before 5g it was all about speed in 3g 2g was about text messages and 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 humans wanted to talk to each other via text messages 3g was about going on a website and you know looking at what is going on in the world through a news portal like cnn or something right or cat pictures 4g was about downloading and <laughs> watching a video yeah right and all those required speed just speed nothing else so now 5g came up with four more items coverage reliability latency and security uh, and that made it more about as i mentioned things than just humans so for the edge queue systems you mentioned kind of a menu of of capabilities what about scalability how do people deploy this at large and and what are some considerations for that yeah um, so edge queue solution as i mentioned is a very software defined solution and we are a full you know wireless infrastructure company this is our bread and butter we think about wireless infrastructure 24/7 and wireless infrastructure is a very wide range of devices it starts from femto cells to small cells all the way to big macro cells and and in in within this range is enterprise indoor outdoor everything is in this range it's super challenging and it is it has never done before actually in the in this market where the same solution can scale from one end of the spectrum to the other end of the spectrum yeah from femto cells all the way to macro cells the requirements are completely different the price points are completely different the features are completely different when we were architecting this solution as at, at hq this was in our mind right that i should be able to scale from left end to the right and the software programmability of the silicon that we have allows us to scale so of all the customers that i have currently half the customers are in this you know small cell femto cell kind of world indoor outdoor uh, enterprise deployments where the box is like an appliance box like box of size of your wifi access point kind of size of box yeah and then rest half of my customers are in the big macro cells where you see the macro deployments at a tower at a cell tower of you know popular you know, yeah carrier operators like you know AT&T Verizon so we are carrying the entire spectrum of the wireless infrastructure using the architecture that we have developed yeah you get to see it all that's <laughs> that's quite the span yeah so we're we're nearly out of time we like to do a lightning round at the end of each episode with some questions that may or may not be related go for it first question in the world of of science fiction and and pop culture and and pop media they like to to show next generation wireless communications where people have heads up displays or holograms What do you think pop culture gets really right about the future of of communication and what do they get really wrong? Many of the things that I watched in the movies growing up are actually happening right now. Yeah. Long back I still remember watching a very very old movie and there a gentleman opens a box and is talking to somebody. At that time it was 
nobody could think about that this could happen uh, so i think people in the pop culture and you know the, the that kind of the world do think it rightly of what is needed and what may come they definitely think rightly in terms of what is needed and wireless communication ai is a good example of it right uh, robots uh, you know doing things on their own uh, we have seen this in star wars <laughs> 30 years ago <laughs> Sure. Yeah. So they are now coming to fruition. Yeah. Uh, you know, people, people like me and many other innovators take inspiration from those those things, right? Absolutely. So yeah, I think now so many movies are coming to my mind where I saw <laughs> things which are <laughs> happening right now. Is building your childhood? Yeah, absolutely. One chip at a time. Absolutely. <laughs> you mentioned earlier that you were good at change. You've moved from India to Portland to Munich into the Bay Area. Yeah. What are some tips you have for folks to adjust and maybe find good restaurants when you end up at a new place? <laughs> if you get an opportunity to live and work in a different culture, go for it. Don't think twice. You'll always learn something new which you never thought you would learn. So that is my simple tip to folks who who are thinking, you know, whether I should take that job in a different country or whether I should take that job in a different culture or whether I should change fields. never hesitate in taking on new things which you are not exposed to yeah uh, you will always come out more rich with your experience i love that yeah yeah related question currywurst take it or leave it sorry currywurst that was one of my one of my favorite meals in munich i had it was um like a curry bratwurst and i'm curious whether you like on a, maybe on a scale of 1 to 10 how do you rate currywurst <laughs> currywurst um 7 or 8 Okay. Pretty good. Pretty good. Yeah. yeah. All right. <laughs> And then last one, you've been growing so fast at EdgeQ. Can you tell me about maybe one interesting job opening you have and and what makes that an exciting opportunity for somebody? We have many jo- interesting job openings. Um uh, actually we um closed our series B round recently and we are growing very fast. One of the job op- openings that we have is in actually in my team. It's is a is a director of product management opening uh, within my team and i encourage all your audience which is interested in that please apply and spread the word and go to our job site on our website there are many other cool openings go for it we are awesome pretty fast growing the work culture is cool and you'll not get a better place to work than sq yeah re- literally building the future here it's exciting stuff yeah well thank you so much for your time Yeah, thank you for having me, Daniel. Well, Adil, it has been my pleasure. That was Adil Kidwai, VP and Head of Product Management at EdgeQ. And what a fascinating area to explore. There's so much change and progress happening in the wireless world and the AI space. I feel like we're finally getting to the point where AI is not a niche application or a public novelty, but a hugely valuable engineering tool. And what's happening here in 5G and 6G research proves that out. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it. That's the number one way to help this show grow. We'll make it easy for you too. Hop on the All About Circuits and Moore's Lobby social pages and share the post with this episode, and we'll send you some swag if you do. So get you some of that. Of course, also subscribe to this podcast in your favorite podcast system if you haven't already. Thank you for spending this time with me. I love getting to geek out with this stuff, and I hope you do too. I'm your host Daniel Bogdanov. May your link budgets be generous and your SNR low, and I'll catch you next time. Thank you.